Okay, we can go ahead and get started. Um, thank you all for joining us. So my name is uh, Catherine Silliman, and I'm one of the co-organizers of the Marine Omics Working Group, which is part of the Research Coordinated Network for Evolution and Changing Seas. So myself and uh, my co-organizer, Sam Bogan at UC Santa Barbara, we put together this working group in order to promote reproducible and robust genomic research in marine science. And to do that, we're bringing together researchers from across evolutionary biology um, to help us develop recommendations for various omics analyses in non-model species. And we, uh, our plan is to disseminate these recommendations through a website resource, which will be deployed in August or September of this year. And um, our hope with this website is that it is a dynamic resource um, where we are providing a few initial content topics um, and then others can come in and add to those, can add in their own uh, guidelines for different omics analyses so that this resource can grow and keep up with the rapidly changing field. And as, as part of our working group, we're hosting these panel discussions, which are um, meant for both folks who are new to various omics analyses, as well as more expert users. And so today we're talking about uh, RADSeq or genotype by sequencing. And we likely will get uh, technical at times, but we want to really highly encourage um, any introductory level questions from those who are just getting started with RADSeq. Um, so if something isn't clear, if there's a term that you're unfamiliar with, um, post a comment in the chat and we'll, we'll try to address it as we're going along. Um, so when, uh, for today's topic with RADSeq and GBS, we're broadly referring to any genotyping method that subsamples the genomes of many individuals using restriction enzymes with the goal of identifying genetic variants, usually SNPs. And so with RADSeq, there are numerous ways that your assembled genotypes can differ from the true genotypes of your samples. Those can include uh, errors in the lab, biases from PCR, uh, sequencing error, or intrinsic qualities of your study organism, like the mutation rate or how many genome duplications they have. Um, and so today we want to mainly focus on the errors that may arise when using bioinformatic tools to assemble raw sequencing reads and genotype SNPs. Um, and when you do this, there's, there's many decisions that you have to make about parameters when using genotyping pipelines. Um, so that includes some of the popular ones are Stax, IPIRAD, and DDoSent. Um, and these are especially uh, tricky when you don't have a reference genome. So when you're doing a de novo assembly. And there have been a few papers looking at what effect these des decisions have on your accuracy or downstream analyses. Many of those papers written by our panelists, um, but there's not been a lot of synthesis across these papers. Um, and so Danny, if you can hit next. Uh, together, we've, we've brought a great group of panelists um, who are either directly involved in developing these um, RADSeq genotyping pipelines or have empirically evaluated these methods for accuracy and parameter optimization. So next slide. And so for the first 40 minutes or so, uh, myself and my co-moderator, Danny Davenport, are gonna be asking questions um, based on these uh, topics, which we provided to the panelists ahead of time. And then we plan to open up the discussion to everyone to ask questions. Um, However, even as we're, we're going through, we wanna encourage uh, participants to add questions and comments in the chat as they come up. And we'll try to incorporate them in the ongoing discussion if we can, or otherwise um, touch on them at the end. 
uh, just make sure to specify whether your question is to all the panelists or if you have one of a specific panelist. Um, and so now I'm going to um, spotlight our panelists, which will hopefully make them um, visible for everybody. And then I'll let them introduce themselves. And oh, hi, Alicia, great. So if you don't see um, the six of us on your screen, some versions of Zoom doesn't allow it for, so just put on speaker view and you should be able to at least see the person who's talking. Um, great, so yeah, uh, if um, Melanie, if you wanna go ahead and just you know name your current position and a little bit about your research and briefly say what your experience with RADSEQ is. Sure, so my name is Melanie and I recently defended my PhD at the University of Wyoming. I worked with Holly Ernest and um, my interest in using genetic methods like RADSEQ comes from a wildlife conservation background. So I like to do very applied work, usually using genetics for population genetic applications. And uh, I recently was first author on a paper that looked at different de novo assembly software and compared the performance of those to try to think about how we set parameters and also just what software we're using. So, and thanks for inviting me to join the panel. Thank you. Um, John, if you wanna go ahead. Sure, hi everyone. <clears throat> My name is John Puritz. I'm an assistant professor at the University of Rhode Island. Um, I am probably the most biased uh, member of this panel. I am the developer and primary maintainer for the RADSEQ bioinformatic pipeline docent. Um, and, and just for correction, the D is silent, the first D, so it's just docent, um, just to throw it out there. And if you've ever used it, you get a funny email at the end that, that clarifies that for you. Um, and research in my lab is focused a lot on how human populations impact the evolution of marine species, uh, working a lot with marine invertebrate species. So uh, that's kind of the approach I came to uh, when developing a bioinformatic pipeline for rat seek data was dealing with highly polymorphic uh, marine invertebrate species. Thank you, uh, Isaac. Yeah, hey, hey everyone. Um, my name is Isaac Overcast. I'm a, currently a postdoc uh, with Elaine Morlan at the Ecole Normale Superior in Paris. Uh, and I am the co-lead author and developer for IPIRAD, which is one of the three um, RedSeq assembly tools we're gonna kind of be focusing on today. Uh, my research is more focused on community scale genetic diversity. So looking at uh, intraspecific genetic diversity uh, in entire ecological communities, the kinds of things that you might get from like a meta barcoding study, trying to figure out, you know, how we can learn about the processes that contribute to structuring and maintaining biodiversity in ecological communities from genetic sequence data. So that's kind of my background. Awesome. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah. Um, Alicia? Hi, everyone. I'm uh, very happy to be here. Uh, my name is Alicia Mastreta Janes. I come from a phylogeographic background. Uh, when I started my PhD, it was all Sanger sequencing. And pretty much in the middle, I had to change everything and jump into RADSEC, uh, which was really fun, uh, but to be honest, really challenging also because I had no idea of bioinformatics whatsoever at the time. Um, so, but what I did know is that FELPs, which were also based on enzymes, had a lot of issues of reproducibility. So I was concerned about the error rates because I have read a lot of papers on that. So that's why uh, for my first approach to the rat data, um, I was worried about how to choose the parameters. So we developed this 
it's called a method of using the uh, error rates to better estimate the parameters. And that's uh, the paper that probably some of you know. Full disclosure, that was my first go at bioinformatics ever. So sorry for all the, when I read the code again, you go like, oh my gosh. Um, and after that, I have been working mostly with plants, with rat, sec, and GDS uh, methods. More recently, I have been going to uh, crop species, which means that we have decent uh, um, reference genomes. So we don't do a lot of uh, the novel assembly right now, but we have done so, uh, especially with conifer species, we have huge genomes, and that's something I would like to talk about. Um, very happy to be here and great initiative. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I would also add that I still look at my current code and cringe. So I don't know. I don't know if that ever changes. It hasn't for me yet. Um, great. Uh, so just to, to get started a little bit, um, if maybe just to, to further introduce people, what was the most recent data set you did a RAD assembly on? What pipeline did you use? And what, if any, issues came up that you had to address? Yeah, if you guys just want to raise, use a little raise hand um, and you have, have an answer. Yeah, Melanie. Okay, so for my PhD, I worked with two different RAD data sets for two different species. In one case, I had a reference genome, so I was able to do reference-based assembly. Um, in the other, I did not, and so we did de novo assembly. And for both, we largely followed the docent learned how to pronounce that today, uh, pipeline for most of that, and then kind of fit in different customized pieces uh, as we were going along. I think um, one issue, I guess the biggest issue for me was as a PhD student that had a background in genetics, but not necessarily in these newer genomic methods or in coding, the biggest hurdle for me was just learning how to use all these different programming languages, learning the whole vocabulary of bioinformatics, and then figuring out how to set an enormous number of parameters to get that done. Yeah, Alicia, you have your hand. Um, so besides the, uh, the ones that we have uh, reference genomes, uh, the most recent one was an Abies, which is a, a conifer tree of 10 giga basis uh, genome size. Um, we have different species um, on, on the genus, and we use the IPIRAT um, pipeline. Um, we have also used stacks for same, that same genus, but within a single species. Um, and I think one of the highlights of problems that I would like to highlight is differences in coverage among samples. That's um, one of the things I would like to, to highlight as a major source of heterogeneity between the samples and then uh, of differences among parameters. Awesome, yeah, Isaac. Um, yeah, I, I well, I, not the most recent, but a, a recent uh, data set that I worked with that had a couple of really interesting properties that I think are important for people to think about was a cannabis data set some collaborators generated. It was five different uh, plates of data that had been uh, sequenced at five different facilities. It really was kind of like a kind of uh, perfect storm of, 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 of bad luck. Uh, and so we had these five different plates of, of data and they, you know, we wanted to look at, you know, we wanted to combine these, these plates uh, and there's a couple of different problems. So one problem, first of all, uh, that I realized uh, early on was that there was a massive amount of, of uh, contamination from, from mitochondrial and chloroplast. And so one of the things that iPyrid allows you to do is filter out, like use a reference to filter out data. So I downloaded the chloroplast and mitochondrial reference genomes from from, from the internet and, and you know, filtered out all of the organeller um, hits. And so that was one kind of like trick that improved the quality of the data. 
Uh, the other kind of issue that we had with this data set that was really nasty uh, is that because they were, you know, the, the libraries were prepared in different ways and they were sequenced at different facilities uh, and just looking at the, this kind of is, I guess, what Alicia was kind of mentioning too in the same kind of direction. If we looked at the locus share in the final data set, if we looked at the locus sharing across all samples, uh, there was almost no shared loci uh, among like across the different the different plates so all the shared loci were within any given individual plate regardless of the relatedness of the samples among the plates and so there's this really kind of nasty batch effect which if you're not aware of it you know you would plug this data into a pca or into some kind of like population genetic analysis and you get five really good clusters popping up but it's only clustering because of the missing data and because of the lack of of locus sharing across the plates. And so this is something, you know, this is just kind of like something that people who are doing, uh, you know, assemblies that are combining runs across different like libraries or across different uh, sequencing experiments need to be really super careful about. Thanks, yeah, that, that's a great point. John Pierce was actually the one that I saw a poster of his that you have to split up your samples from different populations across runs, or you could get that exact exact result. Um, yeah, John. Yeah, um, I guess the, the most recent data set I've worked with was actually with um, what we thought were two different coral species. Um, and we were trying to do uh, some different applications like adding in some epigenetic inference along with rat inference. Um, but the assembly is essentially the same, and, and we ended up finding that uh, not two species, but more like eight species were in our data set. Um, and then so kind of like doing initial assembly optimization and then parsing out into eight different individual assemblies, trying to handle some of that cryptic variation. So that was one um, challenge. But I, I'm glad that uh, Isaac and Alicia both brought up really important things that I think we, we definitely should get get to to talk about, but batch effects and it, sample variation and coverage, I think are really huge uh, things that, that everyone needs to think about. And it's not anywhere that you find, I think in, in a lot of the literature out there that um, you might start to think about. Uh, so I, I just wanted to echo both, both of those are really important uh, considerations. And, and the batch effects, if you, if you don't have a high signal system can really uh, be surprisingly strong in your data set. So. Yeah, great. Um, yeah, I, uh, one of the topics I wanted to talk about was was filtering, um, you know, either as you're doing your assembly and clustering or afterwards. Um, and so maybe we can actually, since you all sort of brought up things that are related to how you filter your data, either iteratively as you're passing samples through or at the end. Um, so yeah, for, for any of our panelists, um, you know, what are some of your personal guidelines you use to, um, as you're getting data working through the pipeline, check to make sure that you don't have a batch effect, you aren't losing a lot of loci because of um, uneven coverage. You know, what are some of the things that you, you check for? Yeah, uh, you can just raise your hand. Yeah, John. Um, so I'll, I'll kind of, take one step back. And I think uh, for me, a lot of this comes down to um, some good pre-planning before you start your libraries. Um, if, if you can, I mean, of course, sometimes you run into a data set that has bridged multiple labs and collaborative groups, and you have to deal with this a little bit later. Um, but the more you can kind of think about this at the design phase, uh, you can kind of help eliminate or at least mitigate some of these circumstances. So one of those uh, is randomizing your samples. Uh, across library preps and lanes of sequencing, if, if you're going to have multiple lanes of sequencing, um, that's one great way to help uh, with any potential batch effect. The other thing that I, I always recommend to people um, is replicate samples, uh, like have the same three to five samples that you sequenced in every library prep and every lane of sequencing, because um, that's the best way to detect uh, whether or not you're having batch effects, because if something's not genotyping the same way in the same sample, you know something is wrong. Um, and so that's that's like my kind of pre-filtering uh, before even getting to those batch effects. So I'll, I'll turn it over to the rest of the panel uh, to kind of talk about some of those other issues, but that's, that's definitely one of what I mean by that.
Oh, sorry, uh, Isaac, and then Alicia. I think Alicia was uh, maybe before me, but okay, do, yeah, do Alicia. Ahead, Alicia? I, I raised my real hand instead of <laughs> no, 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 that's okay. That. Yeah. Yeah. All right, well, thank you, Isaac. Um, yeah, I I just want to echo the importance of randomizing samples. It's horrible. It's you spend so much more time doing it, but it's worth it. Um, everyone hates, hates doing it because of the extra time involved and the extra careful of not mixing up stuff. But I think it's worth it. And I will say that if lab work is being done by someone with not a lot of experience or that is learning, uh, or if the samples are quite precious because they, are, they were difficult to get from a particular population, I will also randomize them since uh, uh, DNA extraction, or more than randomizing, just don't extract all samples from a single locality or any single treatment or something that will be generating a batch effect uh, together. Just mix them so that the, you avoid uh, batch effects at the quality level of, of the DNA. This is something that we have seen too. Um, and it's just more time in the lab, which is already taking time, but I think it's worth it. Um, and something we also do, I love PCAs because they are great at just telling you if there is something terribly wrong, it's gonna, you are gonna see it on a PCA. So it's quite obvious, but just plot your data as soon as you have the first plotable data, even if it's not the final uh, filtering, just plot it and color it by all the possibilities you can imagine, by locality, by species, um, by batch, by sequencing lane, and by who did the DNA extraction, uh, all the these things. And I do that, that's the first thing we do like as soon as possible. Um, if, if there is something wrong, you will see it there. Yeah, go ahead, Isaac. Yeah, well, uh, first of all, I totally agree with Alicia and John about uh, randomization and replicating samples if it's possible. I know that this is like not always possible just because, you know, replicating samples doubles the amount of sequencing you need to do, but it does make a huge difference. I also agree with Alicia that using PCA to just diagnose like as a kind of like rough diagnosis is super useful. It's really nice for, cat, you know, a, can't count the number of times where I've caught bad samples or just kind of weirdness in samples just from a quick PCA and things pop out and you look at them and it's just a really nice way of like, you know, rapidly evaluating the data. Um, in terms of like the kind of broader process of how to approach filtering, I think that from, you know, what I like to emphasize is that filtering isn't, you know, something that you kind of do at the end right like you have to kind of like it's really important to to evaluate the the results of each kind of step of the assembly process uh and so i'm going to put i'm going to put this um a link in the chat to just some documentation we run we run uh uh workshops where we kind of teach people how to do IPIRATE assemblies and analyze red seek data. And this is kind of one of the things that we emphasize in the workshops is like looking at your data is super important. And, you know, it's, it's, it's tricky because like, I think that, you know, you have to, when you're, when you're, when you're evaluating the quality of red seek assembly, you have to, you can't approach it like it's the like it's a like it's just a like massive multi locus data set, right? Like you can't sit there and look at the align look at all your alignments by eye. So you have to develop different kind of heuristics for how to how to evaluate you know the 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 assembly quality at each step of the process. And so you know we're not we can't go into all the details right now, but you can look at this link where we you know kind of help people you know have IPIRA generates like. Uh, uh, lots of different um, statistics for assemblies at each step of the process. And so, so the, the RADCAMP documentation helps people evaluate, you know, think about the statistics at each step and how, how, how 
you know, sequence quality, sample quality or, or assembly parameters can impact uh, the assembly quality at any given step. Um, so, so. Yeah. Awesome. No, that's, that's really, um, really helpful uh, link for both the website and I'm sure for everyone here. So thank you for sharing that. Um, yeah, yeah, Mel yeah, Melanie. Uh, I just wanted to add, um, going back to the library effects, that if you're able to randomize your samples among libraries, um, you can use outlier detection to try to deal with some of those library effects. So for example, um, one of my projects had a species that had very low levels of differentiation. Um, I thought I had five clusters because I, it turned out that it was five sequencing lanes that were driving the structure that I saw in the PCA. And so I was able to use base scan um, to do outlier detection and remove some really high FST SNPs and that collapsed all the uh, clusters together. So that's a nice method, but it does require that you had randomized your samples because yeah, if all of your samples from one geographic area are in a single lane, um, you won't be able to tell whether that structure is from geography or from uh, a sequencing effect. That's a, a great idea. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, and so, you know, we, we've sort of mentioned- I just add on to that? Oh, yes, yeah. Fast? So yeah. I, I think that's a, a great approach. Um, if you do have randomized samples, um, outlier approaches will find some of those library effect loci. And the other thing that I, I recommend to people to do if, if you are going through that approach, like is to actually visualize some of those alignments of those high effect um, loci. You may actually even be able to see in the, like most of the time when you see a wonky alignment, like you'll, you'll know that something's wrong. Um, and so you can, I, I always encourage people to uh, when you're doing some of those outlier detections to find some of those potential batch effect low side, like take a look at the alignments and I bet you'll see what is potentially generating that problem um, that's there. So just wanted to tag that on because it's a great suggestion. Yeah, those ones that look like this and are really weird and super repetitive. Yeah, I know exactly what you're talking about. Um, great. So um, yeah, as, as we've mentioned, there's, you know, sort of three really popular um, rad pipelines um, and you know we have developers of, of two of those on um, and so I don't want this to be a, a battle of what rad pipeline is best but um, it would be interesting to hear a little bit about what are the relevant differences between these pipelines especially for someone who's trying to choose like what pipeline should I use for my very first rad seek analysis um, and so maybe if John and Isaac want to touch on that first, and I would also like to hear, um, especially from Melanie, since she's tested a few of these. Um, this is awkward. Go for it, John. Yeah, <laughs> no, go no, for it, Isaac. I, I, uh, so I, put, I posted another link in the chat. Uh, I spent a, a little time doing kind of like a brain dump of all of the kind of prompts. And so I don't, you know, I, we probably won't get to talk about all this stuff, but you, you can come back and look at this stuff later. Um, and so, so he, here I kind of like, yeah, I wanted less about the differences and more about the strengths of iPyred, just like the documentation is really good. And, and I know that, let me put it this way. I've run, it's been a while, but I've run experiments with like, uh, like a horse race experiment with Docent and iPyRed and Stacks. And they're all, they're all like within, within tolerances, they're all great. They all work really well. I mean, there's different kind of ways that the parameters can be tuned, but at the end of the day, uh, they, they all can get you to where you're going. Uh, you know, I, I, the last time I did this test, Docent, honestly was faster and as accurate or more accurate than iPyRed with simulated data, but it's, you know, it's, it's, it, again, it's like, sorry, outside. Uh, but, you know, the, for, for, for the, the things about iPyRed that I tell people or that I, you know, that I appreciate myself when I'm using it is the command line super easy to use, the params files like super easy to to manipulate 
The documentation is really good. It parallelizes super easily across compute nodes on high performance computing clusters. Uh, another thing that I'm super excited about that I really wish that people like knew more about, but you know, I only have myself to blame for this because we haven't finished the publication yet is the iPyard analysis tools, which is like a, a an API for using uh, uh, Jupyter notebooks for, for, for doing super easy, like, PCA and structure and RexML, there's all kinds of different tools where we've taken all the complexity of managing replicating runs and managing files and all this, and we just do all this housekeeping for you. So you can just have a Jupyter notebook where you can analyze and plot results from your data, uh, which, which can, which is super helpful for, for reproducibility, right? Like then you can publish the notebooks with your manuscripts and put the notebooks on your on your GitHub so that your your all your analysis for all your manuscripts can be can be replicated super easily. So I think that that's one of the kind of like primary strengths of IPyRed is the analysis tools. Yeah, John. Yeah, I, I, I would agree. I certainly think that IPyRed has the best documentation of all of the the tools um, and I've always liked the way that IPyRed has encouraged the iterative approach to analysis um, where you are trying to evaluate at every step what you're doing. I think that's that's really important um, and something that, that I always like. So I also think that, you know, Docent and PyRad slash IPyRed kind of came about in the same sort of need is that, you know, we had data sets that were perhaps not working the way we thought. We're working when we we're analyzing them with existing uh, software packages at the time. Um, and so, you know, both of the packages like highlighted, you know, being able to handle indels in your reads um, for clustering. And I think that made a, a huge difference. And I think Melanie's paper showed that um, a lot too. Um, and, you know, now, now a lot, I think like kind of what Isaac said, the pipelines have really kind of caught up with each other in, in different ways. Um, so there isn't a, a huge amount of difference uh, between the two or uh, between the three, I'm sorry. And, um, you know, I think my goal with Docent was to, uh, and, and the whole reason it's called Docent is that I tried to take tools that were made for every specific step in this type of analysis and write a script that basically like allowed you to use what I thought were the best tools at the time to get the job done. And so the, the pipeline was meant to be a guide and that's why I called it Docent and just added the extra D because originally it was only for DD RAD data, but now uh, it can handle uh, pretty much any kind of RAD data um, you throw at it. Um, and yeah, I, I mean, I, I've tried to make Docent as accurate as possible. And that's, that's kind of the, the place where I like to hang my hat is that, especially for uh, de novo assembly and genotyping that D Docent will will do the job as, as best as anything else. And, and generally it's, it's pretty fast, but you, we certainly, if people find ways to break it all the time, I, I, I don't, you know, it, it happens. You, you throw enough reads and, and enough, not enough memory at something and it will, it will crash. Um, and so, and, and I, you know, I think both uh, the like Pyred, iPyred pipeline and Docent like embrace the open uh, coding uh, that was part of it. Like all of our source code has been open from day one. And I think, uh, that makes a huge difference because it's it's meant to be customizable. It's meant to be accessible, and you know, with the help of you know other people moving past that. And I think that was something that wasn't present uh, at the time when, at least when I developed um, Dosen, when uh, Pyrad was being developed, which was just about the exact same time. Uh, you know, I think it's important to have it in that kind of open framework. And so, it, to me, those are kind of the the highlights that I like to hang my hat on about um, about Dosen. Yeah, so we, we did actually have another panelist who um, had a lot of experience with stacks and testing stack parameters and at the last minute she couldn't come. So we're not just preferentially highlighting these two. Um, but yeah, so Melanie, if you wanna maybe talk a little bit about your paper and its results. Sure, and I can mention stacks too. So, uh, so we ran a simulated or we did a simulation paper where we looked just at the de novo assembly step of a few different pipelines and also look just directly at the product from the de novo assembly. So we simulated data, 
put it into the de novo assemblers. And so we knew exactly what we expected to come out of that step where it basically should just take that simulated data and either replicate it exactly if there's no mutations in the data, right? If you give it a bunch of unique sequences, it should just spit those back out to you. Um, but then we introduced SNPs or indels at varying uh, mutation rates to see how that affected de novo assembly. And then we varied a couple of uh, parameters also to see what that did. And um, so we found that CD hit um, was the best performing de novo assembler, which is the one of the assemblers that's an option in docent. Um, and I'll just say that CD hit um, stacks and stacks two, which perform differently, and I can talk about that, um, and vSearch performed much better than other assemblers that were designed for whole genome sequencing. So, uh, or sorry, for whole genome assembly. So Velvet, for example, is a very popular whole genome assembler, but we found that it performed very poorly with this rad data. And it seems that it was trying to assemble these sequences that are never meant to overlap with each other into more continuous assemblies. And so that was, um, important because Velvet is being used by people for short read data. Um, and so these uh, pipelines that we're talking about, IPIRAD and Docent and Stacks, you know, were designed more for this rad data. And so I think that's something to think about when you're trying to choose your de novo assembler or, you know, the whole pipeline that you're using. Um, and one thing I'll note about Stacks is that generally it yeah, performed very well. It did run into some issues with insertions and deletions. And so we do talk about that in our paper um, where insertions and deletions often meant that sequences were split into more contexts than they should have been. Um, and Stacks had the hardest time dealing with that issue. Um, but otherwise Stacks performed very well and there are downstream filtering steps that you can take to try to, to deal with that, to try to remove some of those kind of false loci. Um, again, we can talk about that more, but I think like both John and Isaac said that, you know, all these pipelines are making moves forward and are, are doing pretty good, but we just have to be thinking about how we're using them and what parameters we're setting in each of them. Yeah, and so uh, John Swenson in the chat has a question that I also had. Um, when Stacks struggled with indels, was that Stacks 1? or Stacks 2 or both? Because I know they've said that they now allow for indels. Yeah, good question. So when we first did our project, uh, Stacks 2 had not been released yet. So we proceeded with Stacks and then Stacks 2 was released. And one of the major improvements was to deal with indels. So we found that Stacks 1, the original Stacks, had an issue yeah, over splitting or under assembling. These terms are terrible, but that's. <laughs> Depends on which one you what you want to use. So loci that should have been a single contig in your assembly were split into multiple contigs. Stacks two dealt with that better. It was more likely to put those uh, loci or those sequences together into a loci correctly. Um, but Stacks two had some issues producing untrue genome fragments. So we measured assembler performance by looking at the number of contigs that were produced in the de novo assembler compared to how many we expected. But we also looked at just are those real genome fragments? And um, some of the lower performing assemblers dropped out of kind of the running based on that. And um, to be honest, we're not totally sure what is going on that's making that happen. I think some more simulation work needs to be happening to, um, to figure that out. But Stacks 2 was closer to the right number of contigs. So that was an improvement, but was starting to produce some non-true uh, sequences. So I'm not sure what that means. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, John, were you gonna say something? Yeah, I'll add that in, in my own like testing when I'm, when I'm doing horse race competitions and checking stuff out, I, I found the same pattern that um, stacks two or stacks one, whether you, enabled the gapped algorithm or not, because that was an option in later versions of Stacks, like Stacks 1.4 and on, you could do the gapped algorithm, then it became default, um, I believe in Stacks 2. Um, the gapped algorithm helps, uh, and, and it does get closer, but it, it does not seem to fix all of the issues. I, I found the exact 
same thing uh, that Melanie did in her data sets that it gets closer, but it's still still not quite. And and it gets and it's worse the higher level indel polymorphism you have. That was what I found as well. So great. So maybe we'll do about seven more minutes of of questions from us and then open it up. Um, and so something that you've all I think touched on a little bit is the importance of optimizing these parameters um, in order to make sure that what you're getting is is the yeah, is the most accurate result basically. Um, and so you know we've talked a little bit about the importance of doing that iteratively, checking your data at each step. Um, if you could maybe talk a little bit about what parameters in the pipeline you usually use, have you found make the biggest difference in accuracy? And how you test those parameters. Yeah, Alicia. Uh, I'm going to start with the easy one, which I'm sure is also common to all uh, pipelines, which is coverage. And um, the thing here is that it really changes depending on the data set and, uh, in my opinion, on the level of heterogeneity that there is among samples. Someone in the chat uh, was asking if whether you include or not samples with a low level of, of um, reads. And it does change the, the, I tend to discard them once that I identify them. And if they have a lot of missing data, uh, I tend to discard these samples and keep the decent ones. But the other thing is that these kind of data sets are gonna have missing data. And you have to just live with it and it's actually fine for, for most analysis. So my advice with uh, coverage will be uh, to do not wish or aim for, um, uh, sorry, to, to, to not assume that your coverage is gonna be high in all samples and that there's not gonna be missing data, just embrace it. Uh, accept that there is going to be missing data and do not, because something that we have seen is that if you keep uh, loci that are present in all samples, um, depending on your quality of the data set, you might be uh, making it much more homozygous of what it really is, first thing. And second, you will discard a lot of a good variation. So uh, this is an interactive process. My advice will be, do not try to get rid of missing data. Um, I think it's better to get rid of few samples that just didn't sequence very well. And the other parameters that are, they have different names across pipelines, but um, the ones that are related to clustering. So, I, and I think John will have an opinion on this. My advice is to make sure how many species you actually have. Um, because um, what John mentioned that he had, he thought he had two and it turned to be eight or something like that. We also have something similar with plants where we, um, we had one cryptic species. And here, the effect of our clustering is the problem comes with the parallax. And it is that you will, in, in short, you will be over clustering parallels as if they were a single loci. And this is the, the more distant the species are or the populations, the more uh, presence of these elements there will be. So uh, play with the clustering thresholds, um, but keep in mind that if something is acting funny, you, you might have different species. And then you have to treat each data set independently or assuming that you have different species. Uh, yep, that's it. Thanks. Are there any comments or additions to that? I I just want to totally agree with Alicia about the missing data issue. Um, and I can't emphasize this enough that missing data is a feature of RADSeq, it's, it characterizes RADSeq data sets. And so just, you know, applying super stringent filters to remove missing data uh, 
is is I, I call I call it a crime against the data. It's a crime against the data to 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 over filter on missingness. And uh, I I wrote up a bunch of thoughts in that link that I posted earlier about you know about about how to kind of deal with missing data. There's a really nice paper by Wang and Knowles from 2016 that talks about how over filtering on missingness can bias against low frequency variance and mess up demographic inference. Uh, and there also is some thoughts on that on that post about that I that I wrote up about you know how you can kind of like deal with missing data in a principled way, right? Like you need to like deal with you you need to like Alicia said embrace the missingness, and I love that embrace the embrace the qualities of the data and then deal with it downstream. Uh, and so I you know I, I have some ideas about how specifically with respect to like principal component analysis how you can do like subsampling with replication to kind of average over missingness that's you know you could do a similar kind of procedure with any you know any any kind of downstream analysis i think i think that this kind of like way of, of embracing missing data really needs to be embraced by the community a lot more uh yes uh, unless john if you have a follow-up um i mean i, I think I guess we, we originally started with like parameters to vary for assemblies, yes. right? Um, yeah. Uh, I don't know if, if, if you want me to comment on that or or, or more yeah. about the, the missingness aspect of, of Route 6 data, either, uh, I'm, either one. Um, I guess yeah. I'll, I'll follow up the conversation first. Um, I, I do agree with the philosophy of embracing missing data, um, but I do think like, I like to caveat that with the fact that you know it's you want to make sure you're you're still counting good variants and that you aren't uh, dealing with allele dropout um, that could be happening. So uh, you know embrace the missingness, but remember like the reasons why you might have missing data and just like use that as a a principle for how you go through your data set and. And to me, a lot of that is is kind of what Isaac was talking about. It's like having some principles where you're trying to keep in the back of your head. And and to me, like there's, I, I hate to like ever give someone like you know like oh you should always filter for this percentage or like this amount of missing data. I, I hate I hate that. Like I, I I'm you know I've talked with Catherine about this before about like I hate the idea of best practices. I like the idea of like best principles that you want to keep in mind while you explore your data set and. So much of this, I think, for the best filtering is to to do a lot of different filtering steps and to, to examine your data at multiple different points. Um, and you know, I think you'll you'll be able to find out like what is a good threshold for your particular data set um, while you're examining it. And so that's that's kind of my philosophy on on those things. Um, and then in terms of the the pipelines, if you're actually if you're talking about assembly. Um, I, I embrace the same philosophy is that, you know, very, very parameters, look at the different assemblies and evaluate them for how you want to move forward. And the other thing that I'll add in that I like to recommend for people to do is to not use every single sample for assembly, um, you know, like take a good subset of your data that's representative of all the variation um, and use that for your primary assembly. And then you can, you know, all the pipelines now have the ability to integrate a pre-assembled uh, reference into your analysis. So I always recommend take a nice, small, good subsample of your data to do the assembly. It will go uh, a lot faster um, for that. And, and it will be a lot more accurate, I've found, if you do the, the subsample. Then try to throw every single sample um, into your assembly. Um, so do a subsample, vary every parameter you can think of, and take a look at it and evaluate. That, that's how I approach every data set. And, uh, how I'll always approach every RADSEQ assembly data set. So yeah, I guess you just answered my next question, but um, yeah, do you need to do this for every single data set? Let's say I'm working on, on BAS and I've done this in BAS, then I get a whole new sequencing run two years later from different samples. Would you recommend that I can use some of my same parameters? Um, do I need to still test everything again because there might be important differences from um, the sequencers or from the samples? You know, what, what are your recommendations about when you have to always test all the parameters? I 
I know John's answer because he just gave it. Is that how, yeah, Isaac? I mean, for me, this is, you know, when I, I always joke around with people when they're asking about parameter settings and I always say, well, it depends, you know what I mean? And I think that this is coming from exactly the same place as what John is talking about. Like, you know, every rad seek data set that I've encountered, and which is, you know, dozens and dozens of them, they're all, they all have unique properties, right? And so there's no, there's no kind of like one size fits all way of, 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 of choosing parameters and, and performing an assembly. Each data set really is unique. And, you know, it's kind of like, it's kind of a bummer because you can't just plug and plug and chug with any of these, you know, if you just, there's, there's no like kind of one size fits all solution, but I also, what, you know, what, what this emphasizes is that there's no substitute for like, knowing your data and looking at your data and being familiar with what, what the unique properties are uh you know that kind of means that there's no real shortcuts but it also means that you will have at the end of the day a better kind of sense of 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 the properties of your data which i think is super important for you know continuing with downstream analysis great so oh yeah alicia so just just to so, so your question was, if you have a given species and you have uh, optimized the parameters, and then you just have more sequencing lanes. So there, I will look at, the, again, at the coverage at, at, the, at each individual sample and look how similar it is to what you had originally. And uh, I do will uh, test some of the parameters, but maybe not on the whole spectrum. Um, the way I see it, there are two types of parameters or two, two reasons why parameters can uh, affect the, the result. And one is um, the quality of the data and the um, um, coverage and this kind of stuff. And the other is biological reasons, like the differences among the genome. So if you have more samples of the same species, you will expect that the biological things that can change are not gonna change unless you have a cryptic species in a new population or something like that. But really you wouldn't expect that to change, but all the parameters that are more related to the quality of the data and the coverage, that can change because it's a different sequencing way. So in, in those cases, and what we have done with the Avias, for instance, is that uh, we are already fine with the uh, parameters that have related to the clustering and all these like parameters that can be affected for biological reasons. And we just tried a couple of tests, changing mean depth and this kind of parameter related to coverage. Couple answers. Thank you. Um, so yeah, we're gonna transition now to questions from the audience. Um, and so if you can, um, put it in the chat. Uh, I think that would probably be easiest. Um, or if you have a question, you don't want to type it out, just say, I have a question and, and you can unmute yourself. Uh, but I'll, I'll start with some of the ones that are in there already um, that we haven't really gotten to. And one from uh, Malin Pinsky is many studies are moving towards bait capture around RAD or other loci. To what extent are GBS RAD seek pipelines still suitable? Um, or what unique concerns should researchers have in mind? Uh, John had a, a answer in the chat um, to that, but does anyone else uh, have comments or thoughts about that? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I thought it should work fine as well uh, for, for like REDCap or HypeSeq. Uh, there is for, for for like anchored or like target capture stuff where the kind of like focal regions are much longer than a typical kind of rad seek locus. I would say I, I, I've had kind of like ideas about how iPyard would be able to do this in a de novo fashion. I've tried it before. It's, it's kind of iffy. Uh, but if you have the, you know, if you have the sequences for the baits, then you could just use those as kind of like a reference sequence and, and then iPyard should be able to to, to, to use the, the bait, you know, to use, to perform a, a reference-based assembly. Uh, yeah, I don't, if, 
it could it could work I, I i would say try it and then let me know how it goes because i'd be really interested to see i just haven't really tried it great um and so david in the chat asked i'm new to rad seek analysis um so i've looked at one way to deal with missing data is fill it in with the consensus in the loci do you recommend this approach Well, wow, so much silence. <laughs> I mean, I, I don't, I, I, I would generally not recommend this approach yeah, just because yeah, yeah. it seems like somewhat arbitrary. It could, I guess it depends on what analysis you're doing. It seems like it, it would just introduce, you know, it's, it's, it's trading one problem for another problem, right? So I, 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 I probably wouldn't recommend that strategy overall. I would, I would recommend probably having, you know, dealing with the missing data directly rather than trying to like hotwire it. But I'm, I agree, I'm, I'm, I would not recommend it. Yeah, me, me neither. I think I, I'm trying to recall it. I remember a colleague arguing about doing it because he had, he was doing this for phylogenetic purposes and he had some very precious samples um, that had high missing data uh, for some analysis, I think he really needed to do not have missing data and feeling the consensus was like the op only option to keep it and to be able to, to include it in a phylogenetic analysis. So I think if you are in that situation where you really, really, really don't wanna discard that sample, it's okay. But I think there are other methods, even phylogenetic, that can allow for missing data. So yeah, I, I will either, I will also not recommend it. I mean, I, I, I think that kind of piggybacking on what Alicia was just saying, I think that if you do have these precious samples, you know, I, I would, rather than just filling with the consensus sequence, you know, what I was saying earlier is adopting kind of like a resampling procedure where instead of just picking the consensus or the, you know, the, the, the most frequent uh, allele, you just resample over the uh, alleles given the frequency within the population and then do replicate analysis and then combine all the analyses into kind of like, a, a met, you know, like a, a, like a meta analysis or something. So that would, that would at least be a way of kind of averaging over the you know the probability of 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 you know any given allele at any given site without biasing kind of based on the consensus that that's a lot of work um i think you also there's some bayesian approaches using genotype likelihoods rather than straight up genotypes that can help with missing data i haven't used them personally but like free bays is one that I think a lot of people use. So that might be something to look into if you have some missing data. And like Alicia said, you like really can't discard some samples that you need for analyses. But I would, as we've mentioned a, a couple times, suggest running the analyses with and without those kind of modifications and seeing what that does to your data to make sure it's not doing something that's problematic. So yeah, as Danny just pointed out, um, some analyses like PCA, um, at least as it is in, in Adagenet and R, um, they can't handle missing data. And so like I have the way that I, I fill that in, but it'd be interesting to hear um, how you guys deal with, with missing sites for PCA. Or are we wrong and it does allow missing sites and we've been doing it wrong? Yeah, I don't know, last time I checked, I was just like he had it wouldn't work or whatever but I haven't used it for a long time I'm just thinking when I was a beginner that's something that oh I will use this and so I'm just wondering yeah about that I think that I, th I don't know how any given specific package works I haven't used additionate in a while but I knew do know that for PCA for a lot of different methods it's not that it doesn't accept missing data it's just that it codes missing data as the ancestral state kind of without telling you right right so this is kind of dangerous in a different way because it gives you, you know, it'll spit out a result, but if there's a ton of missing data and it just codes it all as ancestral, then you're going to get a, a result that isn't meaningful, right? Um, so, so yeah, I mean, for, for 
there's different strategies. But yeah, like the, 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 the resampling procedure I found works really well uh, with PCA specifically. And you, know, if you can go look at the, the example notebook for PCA where I, where I show you how you can do that in, in IPyRed, you can see that I, th I think that that's one kind of nice way of handling it. You can, you can implement this in Adagenet too, which you know, I, I don't know how to do it out of the box, but I'm sure you could do it. Yeah, it was it was my belief that in in at least in Adagenet that when you do the PCA and there is missing data, uh, the allele frequency is filled in by the mean of all samples. Um, so essentially, it's it's biasing everything to kind of cluster back into that center. Um, so if you're looking for structure, it's at least you know biasing you in in you know the good way, I guess, or the the more conservative way. Um, so that's that's probably what. It's, I, that's the way I, I would approach it is is doing iterative you know iterative uh, different missing values cutoffs and seeing if it, it's changing your results. So. Um, one I'll just mention also is uh, I have done PCAs where for each pair wise comparison it only uses loci those individuals share in common. So I'm kind of still thinking about of what that means, <laughs> what the PCA is, if you're not using only shared loci across all the individuals. But um, I think that's problematic if you have very, very high levels of missing data where it's like completely different loci are being compared among all different pairs. But I think in that way, you're, you're not filling in that missing data with any population mean or something else. And so um, it would be great if someone could do a paper on that, <laughs> looking at what happens if you just look at basically complete cases in the pairwise comparison. So only looking at the side that individuals both have data for. And, and Malin Pinsky just uh, pointed out in the chat that um, the low covering coverage sequencing community has thought hard about what to do. And there are packages like PC angst that work specifically thinking about what to do when you have a lot of, of missing data. That's a great point. Um, and so a, a question from Andrew, uh, one of the thoughts that CD HIT has provided is that sometimes it might be better to use hierarchical clustering. Is this something that you have used and found useful? Do you see certain conditions or experimental designs where a hierarchical clustering approach might be useful? So I'm probably the one who's used CD hit the most. So yeah. I'll, I'll take a stab at this one. Um, so the, the hierarchical clustering is, is, is somewhat new um, in there in, in CD hits methods. And I do think that, especially in a multi-species framework, like if you're trying to do a multi-species um, type of uh, reference, then the hierarchical clustering might be something that could be useful and uh, perhaps, you know, helping to deal with some of those paralog issues that Alicia was mentioning earlier. Um, I think some of this is, it, it, it's hard to say, I think from a de novo and like blanket perspective, like how it might help. And I could, I could probably imagine certain situations where it might help and others where it, it would not. Um, and, and some of this I think is, is uh, avoided if you are taking you know, subsamples of your data to do assembly. Um, if you are throwing everything in there, then I think the hierarchical clustering probably works really well and is, is necessary um, to some extent, uh, but it's not something that I've really played around with a lot, um, so I couldn't really give you a great uh, specific answer about that. And Andrew's already asked me this question before, so. <laughs> Um, yeah, and Bailey Carlson actually has a question that I was on my list and wanted to get to, so I'm really glad that they asked it. Um, and essentially, it's it's about what is the future of RAD? Um, you know, whole genome sequencing uh, has become a lot more popular and cost effective in many ways. Um, and so, but as as they say. Um, you know, rad seek can still be cheaper at times and getting a grant as a grad student, you know, maybe you don't have money for a really big whole genome seek um, project. And so 
with you know cost and utility in mind, and maybe also utility for um, different species that have really different genome qualities. Um, like, where do you see the future of RAD in, in 10 years? Will we still be using it? Will we have moved on? Alicia. So who knows what's gonna happen in 10 years? Um, so I'm, I'm, I'm not gonna go that much into the future, but as I have been working more with the crop community where they have not only reference genomes, but pan reference genomes and all these beautiful genome resources, I can tell you that their uh, GBS and RAT uh, are still useful to generate uh, data sets at the population level or to look at um, QTL variation and to perform GWAS and this kind of analysis that really need a lot of samples. And they work very well in combination with uh, reference genomes in, in that sense. So I think there will be still room for uh, GBS for, for those, that type of questions that are population based or related to um, GWAS or PTLs, this kind of uh, questions that use that those tools in conjugation with uh, reference genomes. So, in, and this is just looking at what is doing the, the crop community, thinking that, well, they were doing genomes and other stuff before the wildlife community, so to say. So I suppose that the natural step will be to do something similar to what they are doing. Um, how many years will that last? I, I wouldn't know. Thanks. I guess I have a quick follow-up. Do you think part of that is because of the size of plant genomes? Like is the cost of, of re-sequencing 100 plant genomes just a lot higher? Not necessarily because um, not all plants have huge genomes, um, although some crops do indeed. But it's more about the number of samples and the questions you want to ask. So imagine uh, you are doing uh, plant breeding or you are scanning for, um, for loci under selection related to, I don't know, drought resistance or whatever. Then you want thousands of individuals to be, um, to be analyzed of different populations or sources or, or a, as part of an experiment. And, and it's really what they are or we are doing. It is just not a couple of genomes, it's good genomes and then hundreds of samples of different individuals. I, I totally agree with Alicia. Um, yeah, I, you know, who knows what will happen in the future? Yes, I agree, but I think in 10 years, I agree with Alicia, it's really about what is what is your question, right? And what is the data set and you need to answer the question. And I think that more and more these days, you know, there, there's, there's kind of like deep sequencing uh, at the whole genome scale, but there's also, you know, a kind of like emerging, you know, set of questions that people can, are gonna become more interested in is like spatial questions, right? And so for spatial sampling, uh, you know, if you have a nice reference genome, uh, and you, and you, and you, it, it will allow you to, to, you know, maximize the, the kind of sampling, uh, you know, maximize your sequencing effort by, 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 you know, uh, obtaining a broad spatial sampling, which, you know, if you have broad spatial sampling with whole genome sequencing, and you're really just interested in kind of population or demographic processes, then you're just wasting a bunch of effort, right? So I don't I don't think that that will change necessarily like in the in the in the in the near to kind of near distant future. Melanie, yeah, do you? I, oh, oh, go ahead. Oh, go no, ahead, John. Melanie, you go. Please. Uh, I can just quickly say, yeah, I agree with what's been said so far, and I'm just thinking about I did a big landscape genomics project recently where 
um, well, landscape genetics using genomic data, um, where basically you, you do all, you generate all this giant data sets, thousands of SNPs, and then you condense it down to a single genetic distance metric between individuals. And that's what you're using in your analyses. And so I think that if you're using genomic data for population genetics, where you are really condensing down to these single metrics, um, that a lot of times GBS data is more than sufficient to do that kind of analysis. I think when you want to start thinking about whole genome sequencing is when you're, you know, looking for outlier loci, you're looking at adaptation, you're, um, you know, wanting to look at allele frequency spectrums, and you're starting to use the data for more than just how genetically similar are two indi individuals from each other. Yeah, John, go ahead. Yeah, I'd, I'd echo um, basically what everyone said. I think, you know, even with, you know, we end up with perfect genomes for every species. Um, for a lot of species, you know, once you're kind of above probably 100 megabases, like you, you have significant cost savings by doing, um, you know, reduced representation approaches. And so I, I don't think RADSeq is going, going away anytime really soon. Um, I will say that I'll at least take one chance to plug a different type of sequencing that uh, my lab works on, which is called Express Exome Capture Sequencing, which uh, if you are looking for uh, selection in wild populations, like maybe a good way to go. Um, and feel free to reach out to me if you're interested in more about that. Um, but I do think that rad sequencing is going to be here for a while. Um, I mean, people still use microsatellites for stuff, and rad sequencing is way better than that. So, and it's almost as cheap now. So, um, I think we'll, it'll be here for a long time. It has lots of uses. Um, and so, I don't be afraid to put in grants to do rad seek projects that, so, you know, go for it. Awesome. Well, thank you so much to our panelists. Um, uh, we're, we're out of time. Um, I will we'll be posting this um, presentation on the website. I'll also be adding the links that uh, Isaac sent. Um, those are really helpful. We'll put them on there as well. Um, yeah, Alicia. Can I just please, please say something that yes. uh, there was an opportunity to say before? Um, and I think this is important for fish. And I suppose there are fish in the oceans. Um, there are fish. Don't just filter parallax. And um, we do it because we are interested in population genetics with orthodox, but I think that parallax have a lot of cool information and we already have them and we are just putting them into the um, bin trash. And there is information there, a very cool one. And I think this will be especially important for fishes because I think their genomes are weird as lots of plants. So I want I couldn't leave without saying that. I want to show that up. Thank you. No, that, that, that's a great point. I think there's a lot of like copy number variation work that's, that's starting to come out that, um, yeah, we'll definitely have to look at more in the future. Um, great. Well, yeah, thank you all so much. Um, fill out the survey if you haven't yet, um, if you attended, just so we know who's here. Um, and we'll see you hopefully in two weeks for our next panel seminar on um, on whole genome sequencing and, and the considerations for low and high coverage um, genotyping. All right, thank you all so much. Thank you. Thanks. Bye, Bye. thank you guys, yeah. Embrace missing data. Embrace missing data, we'll make a shirt. <laughs> sure. I want a t-shirt. Yeah. See we'll you everyone. Yeah. All right, great, great to meet you. Good to see you again, Isaac. Yeah, you too, you too. Bye, Isaac. Bye, John. Bye, Bye Daniela. Bye, John. Hey.